For the first time in history, there are five generations in the workplace. According to a recent study by LinkedIn, 89% of professionals believe that a multi-generational workforce re relates to the success of a business. As we continue to evolve the way we work, does age really matter? Or are skills and expertise more important than ever to stay competitive and stand out? Workplace culture is shifting and building productive relationships with all generations is essential to your career success. How prepared are you to thrive and work with all generations effectively? If you're wondering how to thrive in a multi-generation workplace, then today's show is for you. Hello and welcome to the Dare to Differentiate show. The purpose of the show is to help you own your voice, value, and visibility with confidence. Whether you're tuning in live or watching the replay, I am so delighted that you're here. Comment to let us know where are you tuning in from and which generation are you from? I'm at the beginning of Gen Y, but I also really relate to being at the tail end of Gen X. And that's probably because when I moved here to Canada all by myself when I was 16, I had my three younger siblings to look after. So welcome, welcome, welcome. We have a great audience joining us here. If you're new, type in new. If you've been a big supporter of mine, type in big fan. Awesome. I'm your host, Diana YK Chan, LinkedIn top voice and founder of My Markability, where I help you stand out, get hired, and earn more. If you need help with career transition and job search, book a consultation call with me. All right. And if we haven't been connected yet, make sure you follow me on LinkedIn or on YouTube and on my Instagram. All right, today's show is an exciting one as I have best-selling author of four books, Lindsay Pollock, on the show today to talk about how to thrive in a multi-generational multi workplace. Today's agenda that we're going to invite Lindsay to talk about a little bit about her career story. We're also going to share with you some practical tips and advice on thriving in a multi-generation workplace. In particular, we're going to discuss what is a multi-generation workplace. What are the challenges and benefits of a multi-generation workplace? What are the characteristics of each generation? What are the biggest misconceptions? How to adapt your communication style to a multi-generation workplace? How to thrive in a multi-generation workplace? How to future-proof your career? And what skills are essential? And then how to network effectively and build relationships in a multi-generational workplace? If you're excited, type in a plus one. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, let's see who do we have in the house here. Hey, Steven, hi, Abu, hi, Orlando. All right, Kiara, Monica, welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, we have a very diverse audience here. <laughs> Monica's a proud millennial. All right, tail end millennial, beginning of Gen Z, Chloe said. All right, amazing, amazing. Okay. So some uh, housekeeping is that the replay will be available. If you uh, can't catch the whole thing, you can catch it on my YouTube channel. The timestamps will be added later on. I really wanna encourage you to click like and comment anytime, share your thoughts, key learnings, and ask questions, engage with one another. I also like to raise the vibrational energy, Sh share your appreciation for our speaker, type in hashtag go Lindsay, she's already backstage. All right, so let me introduce you to Lindsay. I met Lindsay for the very first time in real life in New York back in September at the LinkedIn Reunion Instructor event. We both arrived early and we were sitting in the LinkedIn cafeteria and had a few hours till the event started. Because of her, I stuck around instead of going shopping. She showed great interest in my latest new wardrobe that I just got with the stylist the day before. Um, it was so much fun to share some pictures of her of my different looks. And we hit it off instantly as we have so much in common being a speaker in the career space. Lindsay is so genuine, kind, and friendly. I love talking to her. I knew that I wanted to stay in touch with her and that I wanted to invite her to my show. So Lindsay Pollock is a New York Times bestselling author and one of the world's leading career and workplace experts. She was named to the 2020 Thinkers 50 Radar List, which honors the top global management thinkers whose work is shaping the future of how organizations are managed and led. She has published four books, The Remix, How to Lead and Succeed in the Multi-Generational Workplace, Recalculating, 
navigating your career through the, the changing world of work, becoming the boss, new rules for the next generation of leaders, and getting from college to career, your essential guide to succeeding in the real world. Are you excited? Type in a plus one and let's welcome Lindsay to the show. That was such a lovely introduction, Diana. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad to have you on my show that we finally got connect reconnected again after a couple months here. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you shared our meeting, our meet cute story. This is why I always go early to everything. And you were so friendly and welcoming and showed me all your fashion pictures. I don't know if you remember, but I spilled my coffee. You helped me clean it up. It was just like <laughs> love at first sight. And I'm so delighted to it be here was. with you. I was. I'm so glad we had that one-on-one -on -one moment together right before the event. And we were able to really just have some great conversations talking about business life and, and fashion. Absolutely. It just reminds me why I missed being in person and how we can do all this online. But that combination of meeting in person and doing things like this is just so powerful. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have a really great audience right now here on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook. Welcome everyone to this show on how to thrive in a multi-generation workplace. So we're going to kick things off, Lindsay, is what inspired you to do the work you do today? What do you I love, love that question. Do? Yeah. And thank you for everybody who's here, especially our shared friend, Orlando. Great to see you and everybody from all around the world of all different generations. Um, so my origin story is that I was an RA in college, a resident advisor. I was in my final year of college as a mentor and kind of door mother to um, the younger students. And it was just the best job I ever had. I loved it. And I went to graduate school, I ended up working in media, but I always went back to that feeling of mentoring and guiding. And when the magazine that I was working for uh, went bankrupt, I started my own business, writing a blog and giving speeches on how to get your first job out of college. I kind of went back to that feeling. I wrote my first book, Getting From College to Career. And for six years, I was a campus spokesperson for LinkedIn. So I went around to colleges and taught students how to use LinkedIn. And I absolutely loved that. I think my mission is really to take hard lessons I've learned and share them with people who haven't been through it, make their path a little easier. And I did that for about 10 years. And what happened is I started getting older and that younger generation of college graduates started to get uh, older into the workforce. Some people had called me a millennial expert. And I started to realize that there were different challenges as we evolve in our careers. And while a lot of people had really focused on the millennial generation, uh, I'm a Gen Xer, but I was really kind of um, dealing mostly with millennials. As they were getting older, I started to get questions from my readers and from people who attended my workshops and uh, courses saying, well, what about Gen Xers? What about baby boomers? What about this new Generation Z? And I started to just deep dive into not just what makes people succeed from college to career, but all through the cycle. And it just happened to coincide with the fact that we are in the most multi-generational workforce in history. And mm -hmm. so I, I kind of found my way to my niche and I, I love it. And um, I'm so glad that you're excited to talk about it and everyone here today as well. I love that. Thank you for sharing about that origin story. And, and I can relate. I was an off-campus don in university, which is similar to an RA role, where I had over 100 first-year students that mm -hmm. I mentored, welcomed, particularly international students, because I could really relate to those challenges. And, mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed working with them. And when I started my business, I actually worked with a lot of new grads and uh, uh, younger folks there. And then the last several years, I've also grown as well mm -hmm. to working with more senior level of professionals there. So tell us a little bit about your book, The Remix. What inspired you to, to write it? Well, first I see a friend, Mike Summers from Lafayette College in the audience. So glad everyone is here meeting <laughs> Diana and learning about her work as well. Thank you uh, for joining. Um, so The Remix came out in 2019 and it was really kind of my evolution from mostly dealing with millennials in the workplace. And that's the generation born about um, 1981, 82 to 1996. So they're in their uh, late 20s to early 40s today. And people had asked all these questions about the generations. And what I realized is you can't focus on just one cohort if you want to be successful. And I was dealing with change and mixing. And I've always believed it's not about one generation being right or wrong, good or bad, better or worse. It's about the mix. And I always talked about the mix. 
And that sort of led me to this word remix. And for those of us who follow music at all, you know the term remix from music. And when I came up with that word, I'm not a music expert in any way. So I started speaking to music producers and DJs and musicians. And this one DJ said something that really solidified this as the title of the book. She said, when she DJs a wedding, which is a very multi-generational event, and the dance floor is empty, she said, I always play a remix because the older people at the wedding know the older part of the remix, the classic song, and the younger people know the remixed modern version. And a remix doesn't take the old and throw it out in favor of the new. It says, this is a great song. Let's include it. Let's modernize it. And she said, I play a remix to make everybody feel included. And that mm. was really the goal of the book, which was how do we make career decisions, workplace decisions, leadership decisions, employee benefit decisions, hybrid work decisions that are not for one generation or another, mm. but make everybody feel that they're included. And that's really become uh, my mission. I love that. That's such a great story. I'm actually curious to hear from the audience. Like, what's your favorite wedding song that will get you on the dance floor? <laughs> <laughs> and that will be maybe a clue of the generation we're from. <laughs> I love Do that. Do you have a favorite song? Do you have a favorite song, Lindsay? That will get you oh dancing Oh my gosh. On the floor? Uh, favorite dance song. So, Oh What a Night was at my college, the song they played at the end of the night to get everybody on the dance floor. Oh, what a night. So, to me, that always gets me on the dance floor, and I'm not able to sit down when they play that song. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love you? a lot of songs. I love the songs from Bruno Mars because that's was okay. those were the songs that I had from my wedding, Marry You. Um Aww. yeah, I, lo I love I love Bruno Mars songs. So type in the favorite song that you had. We'll get you dancing on the dance for it. I love that there. So I have a personal question here, Lindsay. Because you've written four books. As an aspiring author myself, like what's your best advice on writing a best selling book? So I'm kind of weird in that I like long form writing. I would rather write a book than a tweet. I just really enjoy like digging into something and doing it. And so my first advice on writing a book is if you want to do it, do it. It's the best feeling. It's such an accomplishment. Anyone can do it. And it's about breaking it down into small steps, which I think is kind of the way I try to approach everything, which is don't think about writing a book. Think mm. about writing 100 words a day or 300 words a day. And in fact, my first book, Getting From College to Career, is broken down into 90 tips. So each day I would write one tip. So it wasn't like writing a 60,000 word book, it was breaking it down into those little chunks. So I'm a big outliner, I'm a big yeah. chunker downer. And then I would sort of, I literally, my first book sort of used scissors and cut and pasted things together to see it outlined on my wall. Now I obviously do it on the computer. Um, but yeah, you can't think about writing a book, you have to think about those little chunks. So You've done LinkedIn learning courses that are fantastic. You write blog posts, put those together mm -hmm. and you're probably on your way to a book. I love that. I'm going to do that exercise. Look at all the content I produce and how I could stitch everything together. If there's any aspiring authors, type in the aspiring author here. Um, what courses do you have on LinkedIn learning? Thank you for sharing that. This is, of course, how we met. I want to acknowledge yeah. the reference to the chicken dance uh, by Kiara <laughs> in the comments. Very uh, grateful for that. We've all <laughs> been there, the Macarena, the yeah. chicken dance. Um, so I have two courses currently on LinkedIn. One is called Developing Organizational Awareness, which is a little bit of a big title for how do you get used to working in a job? How do you become a professional? How do you learn about company culture? How do you learn about workplace etiquette? So that's my course for uh, millennials and Gen Zs just starting their careers. And then my brand new course is called Managing a Multi-Generational Team. And that is about uh, anyone who wants to lead a group of people who are of all generations, whether you have a small business, you're in a company, big team or small team. So one book is for the uh, one course is for the individual contributor and the other course is for leaders. I love that. Make sure to check out Lindsay's courses. I actually just finished watching the Lindsay's yeah. course, the multi-generational, and, and I loved it. Highly re recommend watching it. So, so check that out. I also have a course on LinkedIn Learning called Presenting with Confidence. It's a nano course, so it's really bite-sized, less than two-minute videos that you can finish in 20 minutes. And shout out here, my content manager, Elmera, Elmera is here. Uh, she's just saying brilliant advice to writing the book tip here, along, along with uh, Orlando here. Amazing. Great to see you here. So so let's dive into our topic here on how to thrive in a multi-generational workplace. And I want to welcome the audience. I see a greater audience now here on LinkedIn. Today, we're here to talk about how to thrive in a multi-generational workplace. So first of all, Lindsay, let's first start with what is a multi-generational workplace? 
Great. Let's level set. Um, first of all, one of the reasons I love the topic of generations is everybody is an expert because we are all part of families in one way or another. And a family is multi-generational. Great grandparents, grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. That's a concept of generations. So most generations are about 15 to 18 years long, which is when the first, the youngest member of a generation has a child, right? So it creates that next cohort of people. So this is a global concept. We use different words in different cultures. So I'll give you the North American terminology, although it has become a little bit more global as the internet has grown. So in uh, North America, particularly the United States where I'm based, you have the traditionalist or World War II generation, sometimes called the greatest generation. They're over 77 years old, still about 3% of the workplace, many still working. The president of the United States is a member of that generation. Then you have the baby boomers born between 1946 and 1964, largest generation ever born into the United States before or since, still an enormous, enormous cohort. They're in about their uh, later 50s to mid 70s. Then you have my generation and uh, some of you watching, which is Gen X. We were quite a small generation born after the boomers from about 1965 to 1980 in our uh, 40s and early 50s. Then you have millennials who are another big generation, not quite as big as the boomers, but many are children of baby boomers, also known as Gen Y. So millennial and Gen Y mean the same thing. This is what we often call the first global generation because of the internet and because of Facebook. So the word millennial spread around the world a lot faster than some of those other uh, terms. And millennials are born between about 1982 uh, and 1996 or so. Then you have Gen Z, born 1997, and probably till about 2012-ish. We haven't quite figured it out. Um, and some of you might realize people are still born, even though we've gotten to the end of the alphabet in our generation names, weren't very smart to start with Gen X. So they have decided to name that next generation kids, maybe nine years old or so and younger, uh, Gen Alpha. Um, but like you, Diana, a lot of people feel like those big groups don't really fit. And so one of the terms mm -hmm. I'm hearing a lot, lady, is the term zenial, like x ennial, which is yeah. someone like you who said, I kind of have one foot in X, one foot millennial. It's There's me. some people who are younger boomers who feel that, some people are younger. So I think we're kind of getting to the stage where those big groups maybe are going to run their course. And people feel like times change so quickly that the generations are not as relevant. So to me, in a workplace context, what I like to teach in the book and in my workshops and in my LinkedIn learning course, I'm more interested in the year you joined the workplace, right? So what was going on in that moment? For me, it was the late 1990s. So it was the rise of email. It was the rise of Silicon Valley. That very much informs how I work and how I was taught to work. Whereas somebody who joined the workplace in the middle of COVID lockdowns in 2020 is gonna have a very specific view of the workplace. So there's the year you were born, but then I'm also really interested in the time in which someone started work and how that informs how they see the world. Ooh, I love that. Audience, type in the comment what year you entered the workforce. Yes, I, I love that. I entered the workforce in 2004. That was the year that I entered uh, the, the workforce there. So what are the challenges and benefits of a multi-generational workplace? So one of the challenges is that we come in with different expectations. So I like to think of it, Diana, and I love this because, um, you know, we're from different countries and you were born in a different country. It's a lot to me like those regional differences. If I were going to go do business in uh, Japan or France, I know myself, I know my topic, but I would also understand that there are some cultural differences. There's a different language. There is different etiquette. And it's not good or bad, right or wrong. It's just different. And so to me, if you entered the workforce in the 1980s, you're going to have some different expectations and different ways of communicating than someone who entered the workforce in 2021. And it's not good or bad, better or worse. It's just different. And so for example, where this comes out is I might say, Diana, get in touch with our client. And you might text our client because that's normal and comfortable to you. And I might say, but I meant for you to call her. And you say, but you didn't tell me that. And so we come in with these expectations of what, quote, common sense is. And that leads to a challenge. The opportunity is that now, instead of having one way of doing something, calling, you've now added a whole different opportunity that maybe some of our clients like texting. And now 
we have this broader toolkit of ways to get in touch with people. So to me, the challenge and the opportunity are both the same, which is we see things differently. And I think generational differences are like any form of diversity. They make us stronger. They give us more opportunity. They give us more options. They widen the lens for all of us. But that also means we have to be a little bit more deliberate about understanding that we all see the world a little bit differently. But I am absolutely pro-generational diversity. All of the statistics show that the more generationally diverse the organization and the team, the more successful they are. But we do have to adapt a little bit for the fact that we all are seeing things from a different perspective. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. I love that people are joining the conversation right now. Um, so this is a very interesting discussion that we're having. So absolutely. I, I love that shift in perspective of when we enter the workforce, because I, I especially love the example you gave, the difference between the expectation of communicating through text versus email or picking up a phone call. Right. It's, it's so different in terms of the, 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 the I, I'm curious, like, you know, if there anyone has a preference of are you you like to text or you like to make a phone call or are you email person? I for me, I actually like picking up the phone. I, I like to talk to people, like hear their voice, hear that, like how they're just feeling. Uh, but I know it's convenient to text or to send an email there. Well, you just described one of the tips in the remix and in the LinkedIn learning course, which is ask people what their preference is. Don't make an assumption, because yes. if you're my client or if you're my boss, I'm going to communicate with you much better if I choose the method you like. Let's say I want to ask you for business or I want to ask you for a promotion. And if you're a phone person, I'm going to be more successful if I call you, right? So it's asking, I have a, you know, now with every client, would you prefer a phone call or uh, a Zoom? Would you prefer morning or afternoon? What's best for you? And never to assume, oh, you're 25, you must want to text when that's not necessarily true. So I think knowing what your stakeholders want in terms of their communication is just a really simple way to adapt to the multi-generational workplace. Great advice. Someone type in the comment, ask for people's communication preference. Right? That's going to yeah. make it more effective in communication. It was interesting. Sometimes my clients would email me for feedback for, let's say, their resume or their profile. I actually would record a voice note or yeah. on Loom of my feedback because I find it more effective and easier for me to provide the feedback than writing a long email. So it's good that. to know the different preferences here. So my next question is similar to the overlapping here is what are the characteristics of each generation and what are the biggest misconceptions? Okay, so I'm gonna do a little stereotyping here. I have little nicknames for each uh, generation. I'll, I'll start with the baby boomers who are, um, right now in the US it's about 20% boomer, 20% X, 20% millennial, 20% Z. So this really unique moment of kind of equal representation in the United States, um, other countries are different. Baby boomers, I like to call the joiners. Baby boomers like big groups. So they were a big generation. They were used to movements, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, right? A big team, lots of siblings, lots of kids in your class, lots of people in your company. They like conferences and big group meetings, right? That also means they can be quite a competitive generation because when you have a lot of people, you want to know where you stand, what your title is. Do you have a corner office? How much money do you have compared to others? So you kind of have this very cohesive, large generation, but they also are a little bit competitive. So boomers like to belong to something big, hence a lot of big companies, right? And staying with the company for a long time. Gen Xers are some of a reaction to that. We weren't as big. We were never going to be part of the boomer mentality. Gen Xers are actually the most entrepreneurial of the generation. So I call us the entrepreneurs. We looked up at companies and said, oh my gosh, it's all boomers. Maybe I don't fit here. So Gen Xers start businesses at a higher rate. If you look at the rise of Silicon Valley, it's really led by Gen Xers in the 1990s. I talked about you know, the importance of starting in that era. Even if we're inside companies, Gen Xers are the ones who say, well, what about this? Or I'm going to go eat lunch at my desk while you guys get together, right? That's a stereotype of a Gen X. I also think we are the translators because we had to be really good at speaking boomer, but we also had to adapt to the millennials. So I think Gen Xers um, can be very adaptable. Millennials, I think, are uh, what I like to call the performers. So millennials came into an era where they're a big group, but they now had two places they had to join and be included, the real world and the internet. So when you grow up with something like the rise of Facebook, suddenly it's not just how you are in person at work, it's how you represent that in the virtual environment. And so I think millennials always have this dual thing of what am I doing and then how does it look? And I don't mean that from a, um, you know, sort of, 
bad way. I mean it from the way that you now have two environments in which you have to succeed. And I think there are positives to that. You know, they can join uh, groups online and feel very included. But there's also some negatives of worrying what everybody else is doing, worrying about the fear of missing out, you know, all of that. And then I think uh, Gen Zs, um, I like to call the individuals. I've had a lot of Gen Zs who looked at the millennials with all this pressure to join, looked at the boomers, looked at the Xers and said, "Mm, I just want to be myself, right? So if you look at something like TikTok, it is totally... Uh, designed for you as an individual, right? Your TikTok is different than somebody else's TikTok. I had a Gen Z say to me, you know, I have four careers, right? I do this on the side. I have my job. I do that. Everything is customized and personalized. So these are stereotypes, but I think each one has some positives and negatives. And it's very much based on the world you were born into. It doesn't mean it's good or bad, right or wrong. It's when the world was presented to you in a certain way. Here is the internet, right? Right you accustom yourself or customize yourself to what that means. So again, I hate stereotyping, but I think when you look at the context of each generation, that's how I would describe it. And I would love fighting or agreement or disagreement from the audience because it's very hard to take tens of millions of people that describe them. Oh, for sure. Like I I would love to hear from the audience. Like what do you feel like are some stereotypes or even just the challenges that you faced uh you know entering the workforce like i think it'd be great to have that uh, discussion there and, and i love in your course you really you talk about these differences is, um, for to paint the picture but really um really having the message that it's important to understand the differences and how we can best adapt uh, our communication style accordingly to thrive All right so we'd love to hear from the audience here what questions you have for us this is a really engaging discussion so on to the next question is how to really adapt your communication style to a multi-generational workplace. How to communicate inclusively and effectively. Two really big overarching thoughts. Uh, one we've sort of already talked about, which is communicate about how you communicate. Never make an assumption. Oh, I'm speaking to a group of college kids, so I should just be on a screen because they love their screens. Well. Not all of them do, right? So number one is to say, what is the best way that you like to communicate? I think as an employee, asking your boss or asking the people you work for or your clients, how do you prefer to communicate is a really smart strategy. If you are a leader of other people, I think it's an act of generosity to tell people who work for you, this is the best way to get in touch with me. Diana, if you have a team of people to say, I love the phone, call me anytime, That's a gift to the people Mm -hmm. who work for you because they might be intimidated to call you because they know you're busy, but you're saying, no, please do that. So I think number one is to have the conversation. Number two is to never just offer one method. In the past, you could say something like, I only answer the phone. I don't think we can do that anymore. So I think a multi-generational strategy, if you are particularly a service provider, if you look at something like customer service today. You know, you go to your bank and it says, do you want to call us? Do you want to text? Do you want to do e-chat? Do you, you know, and you have all these options. I think that offering more than one method of communication is really powerful. And that also gets to personality differences. So for example, if you're giving a town hall to your employees, you can speak the town hall, but you might want to have someone transcribe it for people who would prefer to read that text later. Right, my books are available as textbooks, as you know, audio books and all these different formats. And then I do webinars if you prefer to learn that way. So I think another rule of thumb for different generations, but also different learning styles, is that you never offer something in only one context context. Yeah, that is great advice to have different modes of communication. It's interesting as I hear this and watching your course is that, and, and when I think about it as a content creator, I have the long form live streams like this, but I also like to create the short one minute, 30 second type of videos mm-hmm. on mo- mobile, depending on different preferences. But I also like to create text-based only carousel posts that has text for those who don't want to watch the video. So it's it's really um, adapting to different types of uh, preferences of communication styles here. So let's look at the comments here, Lindsay, of what people are, are saying. Candace made a comment here, uh, laughing at the stereotype as when I coach my sons, they make comments like that. It's such a baby boomer perspective. Kiara shared that some stereotypes I don't agree with is that Gen Z is lazy. We are just trying to adapt like everyone else did. Mm, yes, that's a good one. 
As Gen Z, I was told not to have too many jobs as it doesn't look good, whereas millennials are being taught not to be loyal to your company. Very different philosophies, but appreciate both. Behaviors develop out these norms. Very interesting. Yeah. Stephen shared that I offer phone, email, and video chat and some general time slots I'm available. Flexibility is key. That, that's a good one as well, like different time slots. Yeah. Yeah. What's another one here? Assuming younger generation employees will leave their job roles and not be committed to their team. Oh, yes. Any Can I thoughts address that thoughts one? On yeah. Yes. I have a that. very strong thought, Joshua. Thank you. Um, I want you to think about what's going on right now um, at technology companies. We just had huge layoffs at Twitter. We had huge layoffs at Meta, right? And this is going to likely continue. When you are a member of a generation and you see that, your response is a company will not hesitate to lay me off if they run into economic problems. Now, if you look back historically, for a lot of traditionalists and a lot of baby boomers, companies did not do layoffs in the same large numbers that they do today. It's not until the 1980s and the rise of offshoring that you see huge companies do these regular rounds, rounds of mass layoffs. Once that happens, in my opinion, it opens the floodgates to people saying, I'm going to leave before I'm laid off. If you're not going to be loyal to me, I'm not going to be loyal to you. We also see that 75% uh, in America of traditionalists, that World War II generation, they had pension plans from their employer. So there was an enormous incentive to stay because the longer you work, the more you had a pension in your retirement. Now, only about 14% of Gen Zs have a job with a pension. So there's no loss to jumping from job to job because you're not giving up a pension. So it's not that Gen Zs are lazy or they jump around or they're disloyal. It's that the world that we look at now says there's not really a benefit to staying at a company and these enormous successful companies might lay you off at the drop of a hat. I think Twitter laying people off in the middle of the night over email, that is going to stick with this generation. I was looking to see if anyone um, started their career in 2008, 2009. When you have this massive economic upheaval, yeah. that affects you for the rest of your life, that you feel like things are never stable and you have to be one step ahead of the game. So it's not you as an individual Gen Z or millennial or disloyal. It's that the world you saw said a company is not going to be loyal to you. And so I think as an employer, to show your loyalty, to show that you want to retain employees, to not do those massive layoffs in a very um, heartless way, I think is a retention strategy. So I, I think yeah. that's such a good point. I love that you're pointing this out <clears throat> because as a coach who specializes in career transition, I definitely notice in the last five plus years, people are more proactive in managing their careers because of the economic factors there. I, I feel like when I first started, a career coaching was something that felt like you were a poor performer or low performer to get coaching. But now, like these days, I feel like it's a proactive strategy. Like I have clients where they're anticipating a layoff, they're anticipating changes in organization, and they're like, I want to be proactive in managing my own career instead of waiting till I lose my job. So, so I love that you pointed this out there. I think that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about this now is how to thrive in a multi generational workplace. So there's a word that I came across that I wrote about in the remix that was a term coined by Gina Pell, who is a technology entrepreneur. It's the word perennial. Perennial, as she defines it, is someone who is the age that they are, they don't pretend to be any different age, but they want to be connected to all generations. And there's two ways to be a perennial. Number one is you know your history. And number two is you keep up with the times. So that means if you're younger, learn about the history of your industry. I'm speaking to an architect who is a baby boomer, and he originally learned how to design with a pencil and paper. And in the 1980s, CAD design software comes along and everybody's taught how to design on a computer. And he said, of course I design with CAD, but I also know how to do it in pencil. And there are times when that is valuable. And so he very deliberately teaches younger architects how to use the pencil because sometimes that's a really valuable thing to do. So it's about appreciating both sides. So if you're younger, know the history. And if you're older, it's not saying, I know how to do it with a pencil and paper, I don't need to change. It's saying, I know that and I'm also going to keep up with the times. Now, do I love TikTok? Do I spend all my time on it? No, 
but I have to know about it. I have to understand it because I want to stay relevant. And I know that that's what people are talking about now and working with. So it doesn't mean you have to love it and embrace it, but you have to understand it and you have to accept that things change. So know your history, keep up with the times, be a perennial. Be a perennial. I just said that. Be a perennial to thrive. I I, I love that because what, what you're re- talking about here is we, we want to stay up to date of what's happening. But also know what happened in the past. So exactly. it's not, yep. a lot of companies say like, are you saying we have to throw out the playbook and never do things the way we did? I'm like, not at all. Yeah. But I've never yeah. met anyone who at the end of their career said, you know why I'm successful? I never changed at all. <laughs> right? I never learned yeah. a new thing. Right? That doesn't make any sense. And, and I also think just a small tip, have a network of people of all generations. Look around at the people you spend time with and make sure it's not just people who are your own age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really great uh, perspective there. All right, audience, I want to ask you, what are you learning so far? Which is type in the comment, let us know. What are you learning so far? This is such a great juicy conversation and I love the engagement here. So my next question here, Lindsay, is how to future-proof your career in a multi-generational workplace? Like what skills are essential how to really navigate your career in this uncertain time here. Yeah, I'm a big fan of being a lifelong learner, which is nothing new to talk about, but are you learning every day? Are you continuing to meet people? I think getting stuck is a really dangerous situation to be in. And when I look at people who thrive into their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond, they're always curious. They're always meeting people. They're always learning. Now, Does that mean you have to become an expert on Bitcoin and virtual reality and the metaverse? No, but read an article about it. Watch a nano course on LinkedIn about it, right? Educate yourself, stay up to date on what's happening. Again, you don't have to change your whole life, but you want to make sure that you are keeping up with things. And people say, well, what should I learn about? To me, anything that interests you, follow your interests, follow your curiosity, And be part of community with people who are different ages, because that's going to keep you up to date on what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Always learning and growing. I have to say, I I know, I'm not just doing a plug here, but I actually been really enjoying taking courses on LinkedIn Learning. I love discovering new topics, like just the course I took right now to last week, a couple of weeks ago, I took Selena, uh, Selena's courses on uh, TikTok for business creators, because right. I'm trying to learn how to get on TikTok as well. So it was so fascinating for me to just learn about how to do something differently. And, and it's been great for me to do something I can learn really quickly and try something out there. So love that. Yes. Okay. This is good. Awesome. So my other question is, okay, this is amazing around networking, how to network effectively and build relationships in a multi-generational workplace? So number one, if you work for an organization that has employee resource groups, go to employee resource group meetings, go where the people are who are different from you. And to me, we tend to like walk into a room of a thousand people and go to the person most like us, right? When there are 999 other people who are different, sort of get over that instinct. Whenever you're at a networking event, a volunteer activity, a religious organization, your kid's school, introduce yourself to somebody different. Um, Also, I think you can develop habits that will help you in this way. So I know one manager who is a Gen X, most of his team is Gen Z. And he said to his team, every week, show me a new app that you're using. I just want to see what you guys are doing. Put yourself in environments that you might not otherwise be. And my favorite way to do this is with volunteer activities. If there's something you care about, uh, animals or the environment or your community, if you have something in common, you are going to connect with everybody there no matter what age they are. So do something you're genuinely interested in. I don't want you to go somewhere just because you think you'll meet younger people or older people. People always ask me, what are the most successful multi-generational environments. And one example, we just had our elections here in the US, is political campaigns. If I really, really care about electing a candidate, I don't care if the person phone banking next to me is 30 years older or younger than I am, we want the same thing. And so really follow your genuine interest, particularly if it's a cause that you care about. And that's going to be a way to meet people who have that interest. You'll have something to talk about. And it kind of breaks down those barriers. And most people I know say, Once you start talking to somebody of a different generation and and you have an interest other than age, you forget about how old or young they are. So we know how to do this. We're in families. We have multi-generational conversations all the time. 
trust yeah. that natural instinct. Yeah, that's such a great advice, right? It's it's that we we already naturally communicate with people different generations already in, in our different families. And now we're applying that to the workplace. So want to ask the audience, what questions do you have for us? We're now taking some questions here. I'm going to check into some comments that we have. Uh, Stephen shared. I love the term perennial. My team at the day, my daytime job reflects this mindset. We have Gen Xers, baby boomers, bonding with millennials and adjusting to each other's communication style and interests. Yes. Kiara shared, I'm learning that each generation had their own struggles and not to judge others just based on their age. Yes, that's such a great point out there. And Kiana shared that network of all generations. Change is always happening. If we embrace it, we are more engaging to all. Yes, that is so true. I mean, I this is why I really love networking that I want to talk a little bit about. I, I'm, I'm so excited to be back in person to network again, because there's a difference between networking online. Like for the last few years with the pandemic, I've really met people all over the world because things are virtual. But there's something also really special about networking in person. Like tonight, I'm going to an HR called Disrupt HR event here in Toronto. Over 250 people are going to be there. People who are passionate about the HR industry, the talent industry. So I'm just really excited to, to hear about like what are the latest trends and challenges and how to support uh, one another there. Lindsay, I have another question for you. Another question I want to ask is, what are your predictions um, for work in 2023? What are some trends oh and, that you are you're seeing here? Um, so number one, I think we're going to continue to sort through this hybrid situation. I, I keep saying we're kind of in the messy middle. People want us to like figure out, well, you know, COVID is, let's put COVID in the rearview mirror and move forward. And I think we've been trying a lot of different stuff, three days, two days, four day, one day, you know, all these different things. And I think we're going to find better ways to work in a hybrid environment. So things like when you're in a meeting, somebody at that meeting is designated as the virtual liaison. We're in person, Diana, you're on a Zoom. I'm going to be the person who says, Diana, let's make sure we hear your thoughts. So I think we're going to kind of um, systematized ways of working in hybrid that we had before where it was kind of uh, free for all. So I think that that's really important. Um, another thing I would say is if we start to see any kind of recessionary period, um, as a lot of people think that we might be, I think that people are going to kind of settle into where they are and companies are going to have to get really serious about the role of the manager. I think we're going to continue to mm -hmm. see this talk about how to be a good manager in person, in a hybrid environment to all generations, because I think managers got a lot more conscious of their role when people were not in person. And I'm seeing a lot more manager training, manager development attention to that group of people who are really on the front lines. And I think particularly if we see some retrenchment in the workforce and people really doubling down, there's going to be a lot of pressure on managers to help guide people. Um, the third thing I will say is mental health. I think it's going to continue to be a huge theme, which is everybody had a different pandemic. Everybody's been through a different situation um, over the past couple of years. And we're going to need to support that a lot. And it doesn't mean that every manager has to be a therapist. But I think people are realizing they have to know where to refer people. They have to be on the lookout for somebody who's struggling. And I think the more, I think this is a real positive that we realize just like physical health, we have to be attuned to the mental health of the people that we work with. And I think that having less stigma uh, and being more in the conversation is a really, really positive development, but certainly be on the lookout for that to continue. Oh, such great ones. I, I love that. I would say too, I mean, if I think about, I look at what's been happening, right? This year, there's been so many layoffs. And then last year, you hear a lot of people quitting. There's, I think there's just a lot of um, change management uh, to, to be done there. And I think even right now, especially those who are still have a job, I think one of the challenges that companies face with is how do I retain yeah. the talent? How to retain the top talent here? So, so there's gonna be a lot of things to, to work on. So let me see what else is in the comment. This is great. I love this discussion. I learned so much. What is, what is that? Uh, Orlando shared here. Yeah, a multi-generation workplace helps foster multi-generation solutions and ideas for the future of work. Absolutely. absolutely. Orlando, please share your book in the comments because Orlando has a fantastic workbook out that I want to recommend to everybody that's super valuable. So hopefully he will Yay! share that with all of you. Yes, highly yes, recommend. Yes, please share that, Orlando. Yes, because I know Orlando has a great recruiting background expertise to share. Perhaps if you want to share any like trends that you're seeing from a recruiting standpoint, Orlando. Um, 
Lindsay, you recently, I know I was following your post that you were at some companies like checking out. So the future of work, like some of the gadgets, could you share a little bit about that? What was your experience? What's cool about it? What are, what are the top leaders thinking about right now? The future? Of yes. Work? I had the opportunity to visit Cisco headquarters out in Silicon Valley and they have this hybrid work uh, like experiment area, which was super cool. And I'll tell you a couple of things. One is when you walk in, the receptionist at the front desk is on a computer screen. And that person is working live, but he was not sitting there. And that was such a cool thing. Who would think that being a receptionist could be a hybrid job? And it was. So that was one very cool thing. Uh, they also talk a lot about making the technology more human, not making us more technological. And so, for example, um, having a technology where if you have everybody, if, if I'm presenting to a group of people in a conference room, often they see me, but all I see is like tiny little heads around a table. And they're developing technology where it would almost look like a CNN news screen where you see each face on your screen as opposed to feeling like everybody's at a table. So how do you make hybrid feel more personal? And one very cool thing was a technology that will dull the background noise that people have. So I'm in New York City. It can get very loud. Maybe you are in a home and you're very young and you share your house with siblings and they're running around yelling and you have no control over that. And you're embarrassed that you're home office is less professional than somebody else's, it doesn't matter because it will dull that noise or you have a screaming two-year-old. So ways to say like, what are the real human challenges that people face and how do we address those in a way that makes everybody more equitable in how they work? And I think that's really the goal is how do you make it so whether I'm in an office, in a corner office in uh, on Wall Street, or whether I'm in a home with six siblings or whether I have three roommates, we all look and feel like we're on equal ground. And I think that's a really good way to think about technology. Not that we're on camera, but how do we have equality in that situation? So those were just mm. a, a couple of takeaways. Oh, very, very fascinating. This, this, this is so interesting when I think about that, the future of work there. Um, all right. So let me see. Orlando shared his book, Career Accelerator Planner. Go check it out. He shared his link as well careeraccelerateplanner.com. Amazing. Amazing. All right. I got to connect with Orlando. He's been meaning to have me on uh, me on his show as well. We got to plan a time there together. All right. This is, this is great. Let me see what Stephen is sharing here. We're going to be wrapping up here soon. Stephen shared having a thriving multi-generation workforce can make companies more diverse and inclusive if they're coordinated effectively from bottom up and top down. Yes. Yes. Are you seeing like, are there companies who are not willing to adapt to this multi-generational workplace? Like what are some of the, the, that they don't want to participate because too time consuming or? Yeah, there are a lot of people who don't want to change because mm. the way they worked worked for them. And I think yeah. one of the things that's really hard, and I have a lot of empathy for this, is I know how I was taught to work or what I learned early in my career. It's sort of hard to think, well, that isn't the same world. And I'll give you an example. So a friend of mine said uh, she was an early career lawyer and she had to fax contracts to their clients when she started working in the late 1980s. And she said, I feel sorry for young lawyers today that they don't have to do that. And I was like, what are you talking about? The fax machine? I mean, that's like the oldest thing in the world. And she said, it's not about the fax machine. She said when she was standing in the middle of a busy law firm in the late 1980s, sending faxes for hours and hours and hours, she overheard more experienced lawyers talking on the phone and she heard them dealing with clients and negotiating and having chit chat. And she had this sort of learning that nobody sat her down and taught her, but because she was standing there sending mm -hmm. faxes, she overheard it. Second, she said people walk by while she was standing at the fax machine and they said, Hey, how's it going? And there was sort of this um, informal chat. And the third thing she said, I didn't have a cell phone. They didn't exist. So I read every page of the contracts that I faxed. I had all this learning time. So what it is is that today, particularly if you're working from home or you're in an office where everyone's on email, I learned a lot just by overhearing people doing things. Yeah. Well, now when we're on email, offices are very quiet. Or if you're working from home, you're getting your work done, but you're not getting that kind of ambient awareness. So it's hard to remember. I might say, I don't know, Diana, why do I have to teach you to have a phone call? You should just know that. I, nobody taught me that. It's like nobody taught me that, but I learned it because the workplace was full of people talking on the phone and now it's not. So it's very hard to remember how we did things is not necessarily available today. Yeah. And now I do have to teach you that stuff. So it's about an awareness that the world is different, 
and the need to learn the same things has to be adapted to that new world. Does that make sense? That makes so much sense. You know, what? as I'm listening to this is the last year or so, I've had more clients once they land a new job that they want more support on how to thrive in a new virtual environment. Yeah. Right. And it's exact example you're sharing here is like, how do I be more visible? How do I build credibility? How do I build relationships? How do I stand out? And, and part of it is just how we've been maybe the environment that we we're in before was different. And how do I need to adopt in this new environment right now? So, so I love that you're talking about this and, and I can see as I'm hearing this, there are benefits to this hybrid workforce is like why some companies are encouraged people to go back in the work uh, well, to go back to an office is because there's part of like these chit chat conversations or things that you know that you don't normally hear uh, in a virtual setting. But you know, you can do it either way. My husband just started a new yeah. job. It's global. Everybody works remotely. And when he started, he made a point to reach out to every person on the team and say, hey, let's have a one on one catch up. And so many of them said, well, nobody's ever done this before. So just because you're virtual doesn't mean you can't do these things. You just have to be proactive in doing them. Oh, I love that advice, like being proactive, inviting. And it's interesting you say this because I do hear clients saying, well, am I bothering them for asking for that time? But no, not necessarily. Like you're, you're, you're really bonding. You're, you're and if you are more. bothering them, so what? Do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So to wrap up, Lindsay, what's your best advice for individuals on managing their careers and life? I think we're talking about 2023 now going forward. What can one start doing now? Number one, be a perennial. Know your history, learn your history, and keep up with the times. Number two, be a lifelong learner. How can you learn something new all the time and just follow your interests? And number three, I think it goes back to the advice you asked for about writing a book. Anything you want to do, Take small steps. Dory Clark is a great author of a book called The Long Game. She's my personal business coach and a big uh, LinkedIn learning instructor. And she says, we overestimate what we can do in a day. We tend to like fill our to-do list. We overestimate what we can do in a day, but we underestimate what we can do in a year. If you take really small steps every day toward any goal, think of what you can achieve in 365 days. Oh, fantastic advice. I love how you wrapped up the show here. Three great golden nuggets. Like, feel free to type them in. This was just a fantastic discussion to talk about this topic today, Lindsay. I'm going to wrap it up to see what people are talking about here. Let's see here what we have. Yeah. Alicia said, hybrid is a good schedule for that person to person contact and relationship building. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Stevens shared that sounds like a fax machine function as a water cooler chat type environment. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That's, that's great to hear. So guys, feel free to follow Lindsay on and check out her website as well. She has courses that you can follow. Uh, I highly recommend checking the courses and her books. The books are fantastic. Definitely go check it out there. Uh, it's going to be fantastic there. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today, Lindsay. I really, really appreciate you. I want to share with the audience here next week. I know there's a lot of layoffs happening. Um, I'm going to do a show on training on how to navigate your career post layoffs and in uncertain times. It's a training type show. So I'll walk you through step by step, some success stories as well. So feel free to come join us. It's going to be on November 17th at 10 a.m. Eastern time. I'll be sharing the details uh, later on today there. Okay. Amazing. And what else do we have here? I think that's all that we have. Feel free to follow us and check us out if there's anything we can help you with. Uh, we'll love to connect with you all there. All right. Until then, you take care. Bye, everyone.